this is the second. Apologies for last time and my head, which is sort of the same, but a little bit better. And we're going to go with it. Uh, I put up, a, I posted the lecture that I gave last year on this, the themes and basic ideas in it. And this time I want to analyze it uh, more closely and um, pick up why I put this book on the course at this particular moment in time. There are a lot of books I could have chosen in the 20th century. And in fact, there are far too many for me to choose in the 20th century. It's very difficult. There are a lot of good books, There's all, although there is a super abundance of bad books. Um, but as we get closer towards our own era, the filter of time has not taken care of a lot of the bad books. Eventually, people stop reading bad books. And then you just forget about them. They fall away. The mass production of books has probably made that more difficult. Older books that we have took somebody a great deal of pain to preserve. Somebody had to copy it down in a manuscript in a library by hand, one copy for the library to preserve. And it would take time, money, and the ability to archive it, et cetera, and to hold on to those books. Somebody, somebody would have had to say, this is a very important book. Nowadays, we could get them mass produced buy them on Amazon with a click, comes to you. What that does is um, uses technology in a way that won't allow us to differentiate value. It, it, it uh, makes, it's very good at quantity. The internet is super at quantity. Computers are fantastic at producing or processing at enormous speeds, enormous amounts at enormous speeds. What they don't do is uh, evaluate very well. Evaluation is a predication of quality and uh, excellence. And that is subjective to the degree that it depends on uh, philosophical and theological assumptions. And the books that have been hold on, the old books that we tend to read, uh, or are, are still read, have been sifted over the course of time, and they are called great books because they have, they have been valuable, considered valuable. And later authors will corroborate that by referring to them themselves. And you can corroborate it if you've read the books this semester. Last semester, you get some sense of why this book was read and was deemed great at the time, and you can still see it. Or at least I trust you can. When we come to Brave New World in 1984, um, I'm doing something a little different, although both books are regarded among the top 100 books in the 20th century, probably the top 10, in fact. But I've chosen them because they seem to me to speak to a context that we live in. And I am at pains not only to teach the development of literature over the course of time, over different eras, with a Christian perspective, but then to prepare us to think about our own era and to think how what we've learned up to this point in other eras, great texts, and that includes scripture, will help us then to think about how different our age is from those foregoing ages. And hopefully with a little bit of experience of the wisdom of the ages to look at it differently than if we're fully immersed over our heads in it the way we are right now. So Brave New World is describing a world in which um, conditioning has happened on a massive scale, on an industrial scale. Hen Henry Ford is uh, praised because Henry Ford is the inventor, not of the automobile, but of the mass production automobile. He can give you any color you want as long as it's black, I think he said. Right? But, it, but the assembly line of production as well, it produces in the factory a, a, a car. And here we have the assembly line production of people in the lab. <laughs> and it fits with the idea of genetic engineering or eugenics. That is a movement that begins, as I said to you last time, in the mid-19th century. Uh, and the idea of technology now not being something that we use on the world, although we still do that, but also something that we apply to ourselves. And a great illustration of this is the uh, contraception. This is something that transforms human life. So for that matter, does a, um, a tampon. 
changes a woman's life. It means she it go out in public and so forth. That, that's a, tr a rather transformative thing. I don't want to talk about it and heads go down when I raise it. But I, I heard Jordan Peterson talk about that. Yeah, actually, that's a culturally enormously significant event. It means a great deal uh, for women to act in public uh, as if they were men in some ways. Same thing with the pill. I'm going to talk more about the pill in a minute because I'm going to want us to think as Christians about the, the issue and not just talk about it as a, in a terms of pro-life or uh, or abortion, that sort of discussion. We can get into all that as well. I'm very happy to get into that. But there's another issue I want to address in that, which is the use of technology to gain power over human nature. <coughs> not just a moral issue, although it is a moral issue, but it's a broader moral issue than simply uh, killing a human being, <coughs> which is the issue in abortion and euthanasia. You're killing a human being at a, at a certain stage. The bigger issue under which those issues are real is the broader topic of when you use technology to condition human life and gain control over, over it as human beings for the purposes of making life do what you want it to do, to achieve the outcomes that you want from it. Uh, that is a new thing. It emerges in the 19th century and it is full blown in the 20th century and now in our day it is uh, virtually unquestionable that it happens. Eugenics, by the way, after, remember this is 1931 when this is written, Orwell's is later, 49. But when uh, the Second World War ended, eugenics was, con was considered a crime against humanity because that's what the Nazis were doing, the eugenics experiments on, on certain people groups. They were doing experiments on them, and, and it was considered a crime against humanity to do eugenics because they were using people as lab rats, effectively. And you couldn't do that, and you came up with codes, something called the Nuremberg Code, which required informed consent on human subjects. You have to sign if you do psychology classes here. We don't have all the social sciences, but it requires your informed consent. You have to agree to it, and you have to know what you're agreeing to. That means you have to be an adult, first of all. You can't give informed consent if you're a minor because you, you don't yet have the capacity to uh, know what consent actually means, nor can you process all the information because it's not just data, it's moral judgments that are involved in the decision, et cetera. So it's not just, if I get, do you want, will you do this experiment? Mm, I'm not sure, but I'll give you candy. Okay, <laughs> I'll do it. That's, you know, and a child will do it. Uh, the, the, here's the, here's the, payoff for it, you get, a, you get a chocolate bar, and all I have to do is answer a couple of questions. Oh, okay. Um, so the Nuremberg Codes comes out of the uh, Second World War because scientists are experimenting on people using various experiments. Some of them were pretty awful, some of them less so, but just simply without their consent, using them in that way. That's the context for Brave New World as well. It's not yet gone Nazi but it's still there. And, and Huxley is talking about it. Remember we looked at the video last time of him talking about the problem of technology and uh, the, the problem it poses is the backdrop for his novel, Brave New World. Um, <clears throat> so the scene, the novel opens in the central London Hatching and Conditioning Center. It's in London. London's the seat of the Industrial Revolution in the world. And um, I would say also eugenics, also Darwinism, uh, also social Darwinism in some ways. Uh, we attribute it to the Nazis, but eugenics experiments are going on throughout the Western world, including Canada, including the United States, and certainly in Britain. And uh, along with that, the issues of race, which have emerged in the late 19th century in terms of races, and as I quoted uh, Heckel, Heckel saying that there were 12 races and he would have uh, phenotypes for them and different, you know, they look like this, this color, this hair, this type of hair, this height, this shape, whatever. There are 12 basic races and there's a hierarchy within the races as well. 
that view of the Darwinists ap applied Darwinism to look at the human population as a whole globally has gone on in scientific discussions. And it also is in the backdrop here in the, the, the Central London Hatching and Conditioning Center because here, rather than having races, which are a given, there are groups of people that are conditioned from the get-go. And there are five different types. There's the alphas, the betas, the gammas, the deltas, and the epsilons. And each of the five uh, will serve a certain role in this new global society. The alphas will be the leaders. Uh, the epsilons are going to be the workers. And the way we get the epsilons is we, we deprive them of oxygen in the womb and we uh, give them chemical treatment and that suits them for menial labor. Uh, the idea of IQ gets developed. Uh, I don't know when that actually gets brought in. It, that's easy to look up, but, um, but they will have an IQ not much above 80. You have to have an IQ of 80 to be able to dress yourself. So they'll have a certain, they're aiming for a certain ability, but not much above it. With the idea that your mental capacities, those cognitive abilities are, are going to distinguish the superior from the inferior. Right now, we're, we're, we have a certain view of human nature being presented here. Why would they consider IQ to be the determination of a superior and an inferior human? What's, be, what's the implicit basis for that judgment? Yes. It's science, of course, but it's based on what, a, what your view of human nature is. And your view of human nature is me mostly mental, cognitive. It's not related to your body. There's an implicit Gnosticism in this period as well, which... They also will equate size with worth as well. Large, 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 large. Yeah, yes and no, but, but, there's a, I, I, the, but the alphas are the most intelligent. It doesn't matter if they're the strongest. They don't, they don't have to be like Superman. If they are, then great. But that's not here in the novel. In the novel, it seems to be more based on cognitive abilities. And uh, the epsilon, you probably want them to be big, strong, because they're going to do menial label, like they're going to have to use their bodies and so forth. So there is a little bit of a, um, a reflection of a Cartesian view of human nature. I think, therefore, I am. I think the thinking substance is what a human being is. And if your thinking substance is at a lower capacity than others, then you're a lesser human. And so then you can branch them out and create people with, and at least that's how Orwell said, sees it. He, he has an intellectual view of this, and the caste system is rooted in how they develop their intellects. So the alphas are made for rule, and they breed them that way, and they do breed them physically to some degree as well. But, but what is the most distinguishing feature is what they do to their intellects. And the epsilons, as I say, they deliberately deprive them of oxygen, give them some chemicals so that they really don't think very well. But they can still be strong and beautiful. In fact, they create them to be so, because they're still good for sex then. <laughs> they're dumb, but who cares? Because sex is the, the, the universal aspect of Brave New World as well, sex on demand. It's sort of actually a rule of the state. You get an indication and you go along with it. It makes, keeps everybody happy. Um, but each of the, the, these casts is conditioned to be slightly less physically and intellectually impressive. So you can see, you can actually visibly see that's an alpha and that is an epsilon. And the gradations in between a little less so. But um, towards the beginning of the novel, Lenina Crown, uh, factory employee, describes the boys that she also vaccinates embryos destined for tropical climates. So it's preconditioning in the womb. Before they're even born, they're, they're predestined in a certain way for a certain function in society. Uh, Huxley or could be um, reflecting on the uh, fiction of H.G. Wells. If you read it, I'll, re I'll do it next year. Next year I'm teaching a course called Science Fiction and Subcreation. It's about the fiction of C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien, but it's in response to science fiction. Uh, in Huxley's First Men in the Moon, he talks about a 
how the lunar society has developed or has been conditioned much like this. The grand lunar has a head the size of a planet, basically, and, he, and uh, is terrifying in that sense. And then there are, there are um, lunar um, creatures that are, are basically biologically constructed to fulfill the function that they're supposed to be. That, we don't see that here. We still have human beings. But still, uh, we, sit, we get the sense that conditioning is, the, is what the world in the future is going to do. Uh, and I don't think anybody who lives in the 20th century has a difficult time imagining that conditioning is one of the things that educators are going to do to people. It's one of the schools of psychology. Who does, who's the one we associate with conditioning? Pavlov is certainly one of them. What do we know about Pavlov? Stimulus and response, right? So, you know, you ring the bell before you feed the dog, and the dog, he, he knows that the dog uh, associates a ringing bell with a reward, and you can even m measure the gastro gastroenteric uh, juices, and they, like you start salivating. Food's coming, you know, respond. Okay, I associate with that. So there's an association with that. So every time in the ring. Now, if I ring the bell and there's no food, the dog's confused. And if you do it repeatedly, they'll start to dissociate the stimulus from the response. Even though the bell has nothing to do with food, the association is made. That's conditioning. You can condition people as well to expect a certain response if they do certain things, don't do certain things. So psychologists, will regard human nature as something to be improved upon through conditioning. And this brings me to a book that I am going to pull into the discussion of Orwell, not Orwell, Huxley, here called, by C.S. Lewis called The Abolition of Man. And I'm not going to spend the time that I should on this because it's not the material for this course per se. I do this in other classes in uh, upper divisions. I do it more than once, including for the Christ and Culture class. But um, this is written in 1943 by C.S. Lewis in response to the education field of education in which he is seeing a loss of belief in value as a feature of education or of moral nature. The idea that humanity has a moral nature is being disputed within the books he's reading in England. And it produces what he calls men without chests. I'm not, I'm not gonna reiterate the argument. I, I can't do it just because of time here. Um, although I recommend that you read this book. This is a brilliant book and must be read and must be digested and must be understood because it's as relevant when he wrote it uh, now is when he wrote it, for sure. This book, The Abolition of Man, and what he means by it. I think you'll find it rather complicated, and it will take you time to really digest what is being said. But what it produces that is that pe it produces people that look like people, function as people, but they have no moral compass. They have been taught that morality is not something that is important to human nature. And we see that exact same perspective in Brave New World. The world's better, everybody's happy, they get their soma when they want, they feel happy, they're conditioned for their vocation in life right from before they are born, in, hatched in a conditioning center, and life is totally managed from the top down. And the question that anyone who is reading the book will ask is, is this right? And why are they happy? And if they're happy, is this a, a lesser threat or a greater threat to human nature than what we're going to see in Orwell's 1984? So just because people are happy doesn't mean that they're better off. My kids are extraordinarily happy when I give them a lot of candy. They're very happy. They're jumping, bouncing up and down happy. Before and then after it, even more so because they get the sugar rush, right? And they're just literally bouncing off the ceiling until they get the crash.
but they're happy. Uh, physically, they're happy. They feel good as well. They get, the, as I say, the rush from the sugar. Would a good parent give a child sugar all the time? Of course not. Would the child want the sugar all the time, though? Absolutely. 100%. All the time. And that's because their appetites rule over their heads, and they don't have enough character to self-regulate and say, I'm not going to eat that chocolate because something happens to me when I do it. I, I find I'm addic it's addictive, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to refrain from that. Their moral character is not yet developed. So it relates to education and at what point you are wanting to get are, What are you trying to do in education? What's the purpose of education? The educators can't answer this question in the 20th century, and they still can't answer it. Or they, they can't answer it, and all their answers are contradictory and wrong. They can't answer it. But what they have abandoned is the idea that education is training in wisdom and virtue. Developing a, the mind of Christ in accordance with, accordance with Christ's character, and Christ's character is, is good. He understands the law, he teaches in accordance with it, he obeys the law, he fulfills the law, he shows grace beyond the law, etc. There's a moral nature being presented to us in scripture. Contemporary education is not virtue training, and it's not presenting wisdom. Wisdom's the teaching of the past that's held on to virtuous conduct and presented it as, to us to uh, follow as an example, like mentor, an old father figure for Telemachus. Right? That's how you, uh, Paul suggests that we imitate him in his life and in his doctrine, just as he imitates Christ. There's a modeling there, and Christ is the wisdom of God. Right? He, it's his life that is the model for our lives, and you can't be a fully Christian person until you mature in Christ. So a child might profess faith in Christ, but no one is going to ask a child to lead a church. No one's sane. No one sends a child into the missionary field. You said send mature adults into the mission field. What, what sort of capacities do they have to have? They have to govern themselves. They have to govern their houses. That's the qualifications for eldership in the church. You have to govern your house. Right? So they, it's, it's self-governance, governance of your house, then governance perhaps of a, something broader, a company, a school, whatever. That's sh that showing a certain maturity and so forth. Education is not training in wisdom and virtue. It doesn't see it as its goal because it regards virtue as a subjective thing. It can't be How do you scientifically measure virtue? You can't. And so they don't acknowledge that it is actually objective or that it should be taught in schools. And it results in what Lewis calls men without chests. They lack <clears throat> the thing to direct their passions with their heads. They lack the thing in the middle that allows them to do that. And that's their, what he calls their chest, their virtues. And that is what education traditionally does, is it creates good character so that people know what's good, what's right, what's just, what's true. And even though they want to take the cookie from the cookie jar, they refrain from doing that. And they, even though it's a real pain to keep their children off their iPhone or from eating the, all the candy, because you have to keep on rebuking them and it's exhausting, they still do it because it's right to do it. They hold on to that. Thing. And it's a difficult thing to be virtuous because you have to resist temptations for yourself as well as control others. The controlling kill kids is a hard thing. The sociologists, the psychologists, the conditioners in Brave New World have a better way of doing this. It's by conditioning so that people don't even have to make a moral judgment. They just do what they're told and they're happy about it. That's what's going on here. Right? No? Well, it is. Um, <clears throat> let me uh, read to you briefly. Uh, Aldous, I'm going to come back to Lewis. Aldous Huxley's 
letter to George Orwell in 1949, after he read Orwell's book, 1984. Remember I said to you that George Orwell had studied with Aldous Huxley. Huxley taught Orwell French at Eton College. Eton College where all the alphas go in Britain. Like the aristocrats, it's hugely expensive. Hard to get in. It's a social elite. It's a political elite. It's a wealth, power, etc. Dear Mr. Orwell, <coughs> it was very kind of you to tell your publishers to send me a copy of a book. <coughs> oh, go away. <coughs> Agreeing with all that the critics have written of it, I need not tell you yet once more how fine and how profoundly important the book is. May I speak instead of the thing with which the book deals, the ultimate revolution. The first hints of a philosophy of the ultimate revolution, the revolution which lies beyond politics and economics. That's the French Revolution. But there's a greater revolution. It aims at the total subversion of the individual psychology and physiology. The first one is to be found in the Marquis de Sade, the sadist. He, he uh, regarded himself as a, the most, um, the uh, revolutionary with the greatest integrity. Because he regarded all order as to be subverted and violated. In sadism, he was practicing on an unwilling victim and abusing. Ab sex became abuse and so forth. You know what sadism is. If you don't know what it is, it's Fifty Shades of Grey. That's what it is. You've heard of Fifty Shades of Grey. Hopefully you haven't read it, but you might have. Consumed by women, uh, mothers in their 30s and 40s in major cities, which is an extraordinary thing in, unto itself. I, I'll just leave that aside. Otherwise, that way lies madness. But he regards himself as the continuator, the co consummator of Robespierre and Babeuf. 19th century, in other words, the French Revolution. The philosophy of the ruling minority in 1984 is a sadism. He's saying this to uh, Orwell, which has been carried to its logical conclusion by going beyond sex and denying it. Whether in fa actual fact the policy of the boot on the face can go on indefinitely seems doubtful because that's the way or Orwell portrays it. The future is totalitarian in the worst possible sense. Your opponents are going to be jailed. Big Brother is watching you all the time. You are being punished constantly for thought crime. The very idea that might lead to a criminal action is being observed. They look at you like on this and they see how you're responding to uh, stimuli around you. And if you show disgust at something they are saying, oh my goodness, we got to eradicate that in him because there's clearly a, a, a vestigial sense of morality in this person. He, he is disgusted by this or he's delighted by something other than the, what the party wants him to be delighted by. We need to control his emotions. So we need, how are we going to do that? And then they go to and do that and they annihilate everything human about the person. <clears throat> That's Orwell's, now you're really wanting to read 1984. That's Orwell's vision. That's why I put it last. Um, but Huxley says, my own belief is that the ruling oligarchy will find less arduous and wasteful ways of governing and satisfying its lust for power. And these ways will resemble those which I described in Brave New World. I've had occasion recently to look into the history of animal magnetism and hypnotism and have been greatly struck by the way in which for 150 years the world has refused to take serious cognizance of the discoveries of Mesmer, Braid, Esdale, and the rest. Partly because of the prevailing materialism and partly because of prevailing respectability, 19th century philosophers and men of science were not willing to investigate the odder facts of psychology for practical men, such as politicians, soldiers, and policemen to apply in the field of government. Thanks to the voluntary ignorance of our fathers, the advent of the ultimate revolution was delayed for five or six generations. So what he's describing in Brave New World didn't come about simply because those men were a little bit too affected by religion. Even though they didn't believe, they still held on to something of that. Well, we won't do that. That's not, that's not what a gentleman does. 
we, we read Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde and saw that that's sort of breaking down there. And he's, looking, he's exploring that here. But he says, with the next generation, now, or, but now psychoanalysis is being combined with hypnosis, hypnosis, hypnosis and hypnosis has been made easy and in, indefinitely extensible through the use of barbiturates, by which he means chemicals, drugs, which, for psychology to deal with certain things, to, give, to pump you up, to push you down, whatever, to control you, if you've got too much energy, to whatever, which induce a hypnoid and suggestible state in even the most recalcitrant subjects. So their minds are controlled by their bodies or by their brains. Yes? It, it grows, and yes, they're very interested in it. They're interested in it to some degree on themselves, but um, most people don't want to try the thing on themselves. We'll try it on somebody else and see what happens first. I'll come back to this when Lewis comments on it. But within the next generation, this is 1949, I believe that the world's rulers will discover that infant conditioning and narco-hypnosis are more efficient as instruments of government than clubs and prison. By clubs, he means sticks to beat. And that the lust for power can be just as completely satisfied by suggesting people into loving their servitude as by flogging and kicking them into obedience. In other words, his novel is more realistic. They'll want servitude. They'll love it. That's the way of the future because we can condition them to love servitude. And that's what's going on in Brave New World. Society, marriage, family, procreation have been eliminated. Babies are genetically engineered and grown in bottles. Citizens are programmed to productive, uh, be productive and complacent through biological manipulation psychological conditioning and this drug called soma everybody is as he says uh hypnotized we say hypnotized lewis calls this the abolition of man when when moral nature is to is tossed out of education which it has been in the 20th century and still is in the public system. You're not, you didn't go to school to be educated, by the way. That's not the purpose of schools. Never mind. I, I'll just say it and leave it as a controversial statement, and I'll pick it up some other time. Let me go to C.S. Lewis on this. This is the third in the three uh, lectures on it. He says this, and you, you'll, you'll immediately see the relevance. Man's conquest of nature is an expression often used to describe the progress of applied science. <clears throat> Man has nature whacked, said someone to a friend of mine not long ago. In their context, the words had a certain tragic beauty for the speaker was dying of tuberculosis. No matter, he said, I know I'm one of the casualties. Of course, there are casualties on the winning as well as on the losing side, but that doesn't alter the fact that it is winning. I have chosen this story as my point of departure in order to make it clear that I do not wish to disparage all that is really beneficial in the process described as man's conquest, much less that all real devotion and self-sacrifice that has gone to make it possible. But having done so, I must proceed to analyze this conception a little bit more closely. In what sense is man the possessor of increasing power over nature? In what sense? And now he uses three examples. The airplane, the wireless, a wireless is old thing. You see it like the, the cell phone. It's the same. The airplane, the, the cell phone, and the contraceptive. In a civilized community, in peacetime, anyone can, be, can pay for them, may use these things. But it cannot strictly be said that when he does so, he is exercising his own proper or individual power over nature. If I pay you to carry me, I'm not, therefore, a strong man. Any or all of the three things I've mentioned can be withheld from some men by other men, by those who sell or by those who allow the sale or those who own the source of production or those who make the goods. So what we call man's power is in reality a power possessed by some men, which they may or may not allow other men to profit by. Again, 
as regards the powers manifested in the airplane or the wireless, again, let's say the cell phone, man is as much the patient, that is, suffers, or the subject as the possessor, since he's the target for both bombs and for propaganda. Airplanes drop bombs. Wireless are the means for propaganda, just like your cell phone is. Do you benefit from it or do you suffer from it? Both. But it's when you say gain power over nature, are you actually gaining or are you losing? Remember I said that with, uh, with social media, which is free, it's not free and there is a product and it's you, the consumer, are the consumable good being sold, your data being sold to others, right? For their purposes. By contraception, this is the most interesting bit, simply, Oops. And as regards contraceptives, there is a paradoxical negative sense in which all possible future generations are the patients or subjects of a power wielded by those already alive. By contraception, simply they are denied existence. By contraception used as a means of selective breeding, closer to this, they are without their concurring voice made to be what one generation, for its own reasons, may choose to prefer. From this point of view, what we call man's power over nature turns out to be a power exercised by some men over other men with nature as its instrument. So now nature is the instrument. That's what's going on with biological conditioning. It's a power over nature which some men will wield over other men with nature as the instrument for it. Now, nature has been instrumentalized. The contraceptive pill stops, nobody's quite sure how it works, but it stops fertility from happening. Um, it is, of course, a common place to complain that men have hitherto used badly and against the fellows the powers that science have, has given them. That's not the point I'm trying to make. I'm not speaking of particular corruptions and abuses, which an increase of moral virtue could cure, like the Nazis. I'm not talking about if, they were, if the Nazis were better people, then what they did would be okay. He's talking about the use of it all together. He's not saying the good guys could use it, the bad guys couldn't. He's saying that in either case, the good guys or the bad guys, the good guys will gain power over other people and nature will be the instrument. So it, are the good guys actually that good? Here's the problem, right? It's not about the, what, what the Nazis will do with it. It's what any person will do with it, given the power that they have over other people with nature as an instrument. So I am now considering what that thing called man's power in nature must always and essentially be. All long-term exercises of power, especially in breeding, must mean the power of early generations over later ones. Think about that power. I can stop people from ever existing. In the green movement of our day, we're being encouraged not to have children to protect the planet, but what we're doing is actually a vetoing the voices of a, of a future generation which would come about from human nature. Is there any discussion of the moral implications of that? They're not gonna vote against you, they have no vote, they don't, they don't yet exist, but the implications are vast. The people who are going to not exist by virtue of my control or by social conditioning or propaganda not to have children are, are denying the basic humanity of the future generations and in fact trying to orchestrate it so they don't come about. Is that an, a neutral act? Is it a moral act? We're being told it's a moral act, but remember we get propaganda all the time. But to deny somebody the existence that they will benefit from, is that not inherently immoral? Is it not gaining power over life and playing God with the future? And the answer is, these are rhetorical questions. The answer is yes, in each case. And Lewis will go on with this. And he says, in reality, of course, if any one age really attains by eugenics and scientific education, the power to make its descendants what it pleases, all men who live after it are the patients of that power. They are weaker 
not stronger. For though we may have put wonderful machines in their hands, we have preordained how they are to use them. And if, as is almost certain, the age which had thus attained maximum power over posterity were also the age most emancipated from tradition, it would be engaged in reducing the power of its predece predecessors almost as drastically as that of its successors. That's what's going to happen in 1984, by the way. They're going to blot out history. They can't have any competitors. And they're going to blot out the future. So the power that is gained is at the expense of all of humanity throughout human history, and in particular, from a Christian vantage point, the significance of the incarnation. That man who transformed human history is going to be eradicated. He's no longer going to be the template, the model of human life, the idea of dying in the place of others, giving yourself over to death as a servant, is replaced by using human nature as a master and, ex and, and exerting power over all of human history, past and future, in the present by controlling your biological functions. That's what's going on in Brave New World, I submit to you. I'm not going to go further down the C.S. Lewis track. I'll say one final thing. Have you heard of B.F. Skinner? There he is. What is he? He is a psychologist. Oops. I won't go to the Skinner box. Let's go to Skinner himself. American psychologist, behaviorist, inventor, social philosopher, Pierce Professor of psych Psychology at Harvard, till his retirement in 1974. Considering free will to be an illusion, Skinner saw human action as dependent on consequences of previous actions, a theory he would articulate as the principle of reinforcement. If the consequences to an action are bad, there is a high chance the action will not be repeated. So you just punish. It, it's, it's like Pavlov, right? So if, you, if, if somebody does a bad thing and you beat them, then they're not going to want to get beaten again. Or if you reward them, likewise. It's operant conditioning. It's, it's doing something like we see in Brave New World. It's called conditioners. By the way, C.S. Lewis in The Abolition Man at the outset Right at the outset, he calls the modern educators of his day conditioners. His exact word. They use conditioning. Now, this man, B.F. Skinner, the reason I mention him is because Skinner called C.S. Lewis the chief opponent or chief representative of the literatures of virtue and freedom that opposed conditioning. The chief opponent is C.S. Lewis. Now, he writes this in 1971. C.S. Lewis died in 1964. I would have loved to have heard Lewis's response. But here you get a conditioner who doesn't believe in human free will, doesn't believe in morality, thinks these are subjective things that can be conditioned, controlled, arguing against the tradition of wisdom and virtue, which I've tried to present to you this semester in the courses. So there is a hostility within the academy against the very thing that is at stake, which is humanity. And it's the human sciences against the humanities. The humanities which are being killed off by the human sciences, because the human sciences want a condition as a way of education. The humanities which want to inculcate, now, as I say, read Lewis's The Abolition of Man, and he will lay that out for you. You'll find it very fascinating. Yes, sir. Well, he calls it operant conditioning, so it's something that we do to the human subject. So then it's purely external. Yeah, but the, the individual responds to it. But still, they respond to an external. Is, is the premise that they postulate? Yeah, because they, we don't have free will anyway. He thinks that we're, we're captive to our desires, etc. Free will and surely they don't he thinks, it's a, he thinks it's an illusion. Yeah. It's, it's a myth that people like C.S. Lewis defend in his fiction. And, and the idea that there is that the uh, life of wisdom and virtue, which I said was the purpose of education, is, an, is a humanistic ideal that uh, needs to go the way of the dodo. It needs to die out so that we can get a better way of conditioning and a better way of uh, create a better society. And that's the better societies there in Brave New World. So they, in a sense, deny the agency of the individual. 
Yes? Because free will entails that. You have a human, you have a human being who is effectively an animal. Human, animals don't have free will. Free will is a, use that, a word that we use to exempt ourselves from total conditioning. But the best societies totally condition, he says. He'll appeal to the Spartans, right? So the Spartans, will, they, they breed people to, for war. They don't want any ideas of choices and dissent and stuff like that. You are, and armies condition through rigorous you know, punishments, rewards, whatever, codes of valor, whatever. You're going to do what you're told to do on command. And you respond like that with joy. If an army is conditioned to fight but has no moral restraint on its actions, what will it not do? Historically, soldiers, it's not, this, it's not the war that's the problem, it's the j justice of the war that's the issue. If somebody's trying to annihilate you, you better want to fight to defend your country, right? And that's a, out of a moral concern. It's not the war, it's the morality of the conditions of the war, that's the issue. In a, in a world where there's no free will and where moral considerations are secondary to managed outcomes, um, we get the scenarios of Brave New World in 1984, quite frankly. They don't deny individuality, but they just say that we're members of a species. Because in Huxley, he talks about the Mark Mark theory, where there's a particular instance where he is acutely aware of his individuality, which he finds to be odd. Yeah, so, that, so this, is the, this, is the, this is what makes the novel good. So there's the overarching template, template of a one world government in which the alphas run everything and everybody beneath them is happy. That's the general portrait, you know, the, the masses in general. But within that, we get individuals that are named. And I mentioned Lenina Crown, we have Mustafa Mond himself, we have Bernard Marx, we have Helmholtz Watson, those four, we have other characters, but named individuals. And they, are, they generally agree, but also there are aspects of them that question whether this world is so good after all. They're a little dissatisfied with it. And the way he uh, convinces us to see something like that is when they go on a sort of a tourism expedition to go where the savages live. Because it's like looking in, in the zoo. It's like, oh! And they, and they read Shakespeare here, and, and they have children. And, and oh my goodness, they don't do things the way we do. And it, it's like, oh, it's like, as I say, going to a zoo to see some animal that has not yet been conditioned. And they're supposed to be horrified by this. Some of them are, some of them aren't. Some of them get there and want back, desperately want back, because it was easier in the place where there was no virtue, where there was no freedom. That was easier. Everything was managed for me. I, I prefer that. But, but he, he, Orwell, makes us, Orwell, Huxley makes us through the, it's his protagonist, make, makes us question whether this brave new world is as good as it is being sold to us by those who are in the position of being the conditioners, right? The ones that Lewis talks about as being the one who will abolish man for the sake of man, but actually only benefit himself. The real picture is that of one dominant age, let's suppose the 100th century AD, which resists all previous ages most successfully and dominates all subsequent ages most irresistibly and is thus the real master of the human species. But then within that, this master generation itself, an infinitesimal minority of the species, the power will be exercised by a minority smaller still, a, a small group within the small group. And ultimately, the power will come at the expense of the life of everyone else. There'll be no one left. So they gain the Übermensch quality by cutting loose the Untermensch. By the way, the Untermensch is the phrase that the Nazis use for all of the sub-Aryan races. We can just cut them loose, kill them, and we expedite. We gain power over nature, over 
our human nature by helping evolution on, by conditioning it, by getting rid of free will, get, by getting rid of notions of, religions historically do this. They teach people a moral code. They teach people to live virtuously. They teach people right and wrong. They uh, inculcate uh, ideas of uh, self-reliance and respect and so forth. When you see a traffic light, you don't run the traffic light. It's red, so you stop. You may want to get there quickly, but if you run every red light along the way, then you're putting other people's lives at risk, and yours as well, but um, you know what you're doing and they don't know what you're doing. Um, it takes a society of trust where you trust other people to do the right thing to function, but that means internal regulation. What happens if you fall down, you're hurt in the street? In Canada is usually somebody will ask after your well-being. In some countries, they're just going to keep on walking. How come? They're just as human in those countries. What is it? People used to be much more caring in, and trusting in this country than they are now. What, what changed? What produced the change? Immigration is a lazy response. It's not incorrect entirely, but it's a lazy response. There's more, there's more to it than that. Yes? Diversity? Yeah, diversity as a, as a goal without any explanation. Well, why would diversity even be a good thing? I'm not saying it isn't, but what makes diversity good? What do we mean, what, what do we mean by diversity? Exactly. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, I, I know what the slogans are, but what exactly is good about diversity per se? I guess you could say it goes against the view of human nature in the 19th century of different, the 12 different races and say, well, we're not going to have any one race be dominant. We'll have all the races mixed like 12 different flavors of ice cream. And, and that will rectify the problem of human nature. But for me, it doesn't rectify it. It just means I get better food in Toronto. You know, I get better flavors from different places, and okay, well, that's great. I, I really like that. I like that diversity a lot. But it still begs the question of what is human nature, and it's not the, yes, I grant it's not the white versus the black versus the whatever, but is there something inherent common to them all that is that? That would not be diversity then. That would be something on which we're unified. And that's not promoted. And that, I say, diversity is a, is a sort of a diversionary tactic which sketches and avoids the issue of how should, we, how should we govern ourselves better as people, to live better. Yeah, but diversity for, it, for its own sake is just such errant nonsense. <clears throat> Doesn't do anything other than, I guess, as I say, improve the food. From my vantage, I like that. I have a colleague who only likes American food. What does that exactly mean? I don't even know. It means hamburgers, yeah, yeah basically. <laughs> which is basically Canadian food as well, so never mind. Uh, which is fine. Um, but he's, he, so he's being very careful with us. I'm only making clear that man, what man's conquest of nature really means, and especially that final stage of the conquest, which perhaps is not far off. The final stage has come when man, by eugenics, by prenatal conditioning, uh-uh-uh, and by an education and propaganda based on a perfect applied psychology has obtained full control over himself. Human nature will be the last part of nature to surrender to man. The battle will then be won. We shall then have the, bre the thread of life out of the hand of Clothu, one of the fates that cuts, and be henceforth free to make our species whatever we wish it to be. The battle will indeed be won, but who precisely will have won it? For the power of man to make himself whatever he pleases means, as we've seen, the power of some men to make other men what they please. And here's the problem, the greatest problem. In the older systems, the kind of person that teachers were trying to produce and the motives pr were for producing them were held up by a universal law, a standard of beauty, justice, goodness, truth, that under which everybody was held to be considered equal. The king is not exempt from the law. He's not above the law. He's subjected to the law. He's subjected to all the same rules, the same code of conduct, the same, because 
these are true for everybody. That's the Tao, the moral law. That's a norm that the teachers were subject to themselves and from which they claimed no liberty to depart. I have a lifestyle policy and a theological statement that I were required to sign up to and agree to and practice. And I gladly do that because I think it's true and it applies to me. I don't think there's one rule for me and there's another rule for you. Because if I did, I would be teaching you that rules are something that the authorities have to keep you in a position, but actually they don't even believe in their own rules. They're arbitrary and they make no sense, and they're certainly not for your good, but they're rules, and I'm gonna punish you if you don't follow them. That's a certain type of law or rules that's de detached from moral considerations. Is to do what I say, or I'll punish you? What I'm teaching you over the course of the course is as we move through the enlightenment, it moves more in that direction. But in the Christian, in the, in, under the influence of Christianity, it is not so. The same law applies to the prince as it does to the pauper. And that's the biblical view. Because why? Because everyone bears the image of God. That's why. Every individual bears the image of God, which is why we shall not murder. Genesis 9 verse 4. Why, don't you mur why can't you murder someone? Because the person you murdered bears the image of God as just as you can, so you can't do that. They, there has to be a process. They have to go through the court of justice. You can't just murder somebody willy-nilly, even if they did something that is so grievous and harmful that you want to murder them. You, you may not do that. Why? Because they bear the image of God. It's, it's not a moral consideration. It's a higher one. There's something about this person. That we don't see even considered in Brave New World, because again, uh, Huxley is not a Christian, but he's pointing out the problem of the conditioners as a non-Christian, which we can see for ourselves. He, he intuits there's something wrong with this. And it's partly the loss of freedom, and it's partly the loss of culture. They read Shakespeare here in this benighted, uncivil, or the, the barbaric world, but they don't read Shakespeare in Brave New World, because all they want is more soma and more sex. They're not interested in art or culture or reading or civilization or history or moral considerations. Not interested. No in music. The, the good, the beautiful, the true. No interest. Pleasure. Immediate pleasure. Very interested. Bred for it. But say within the novel, the individuals that he presents to us express their dissatisfaction with that in various ways, just hinting that something's not quite right. It's very subtle, but he says that it's coming. In very, well, you saw the letter I read out to you to, all, uh, to Orwell. He said, it's coming. This is, this is the way things are moving. My question to you is, are things moving this way? When he wrote that, 1949, did things move that, the way he said? I think they did. So there was a norm to which the teachers themselves were subject and from which they claimed no liberty to depart. They did not cut men to the sem some pattern they had chosen. They didn't hatch them, in, as in Brave New World. They didn't hatch them to be alpha, betas, etc. You weren't pre-figured. You, you have the image of God and you will determine yourself according to a template of human nature that I'm gonna try and teach you and lay before you, but you will choose to follow it. I can't force it on you. If I force it, I've already ruined the process because you're adults now. Children, you can, you can coax, cajole, incentivize a little bit. Still works with adults a little bit to some degree, right? You have to have some sort of sanctions and incentives and so forth. I have to give you grades as rewards, little carrots along the way. But at the end of the day, because that's what it is, it's encouragement. I'm doing well, I'm, I'm making progress, I can see it. It's developmental as well, that's part of the process, but it, it's incentivizing, pulling a long way. But at the end of the day, it's making you want to do what's good for you because you recognize what's good and true and beautiful and just and you want that from within you. It's a desire that is awoken. 
Lewis calls it, um, he says the problem with students in his day is not like the, uh, that they're jungles that need to be cut down because they're so bad. He says they're like deserts that need to be irrigated. There's nothing there. They've, been, they, they've had life so, um, so much virtue and wisdom has t been taken away from them and they've been so consumed with pleasure, superficial pleasures, material pleasures, that there's not much there but he thinks it's still there and you can awaken it in them. And so he says, they didn't cut some powder and they chosen. They handed on what they had received. They initiated the young neophyte into the mystery of humanity which overarched him and them alike, the teacher and the students. It was but old birds teaching young birds to fly. I'm an old bird. That's, it's, it's teaching people to use their wings. And here's how to fly, here's the direction to fly etc. This, this will be changed. Values are now mere natural phenomena. Judgments of value are to be produced in the pupil as part of the conditioning. B.F. Skinner, whatever tau there is will be the product, not the motive of education. It's not the motive. You don't do it because it's good or because it's just or because it's beautiful or because it's right. That becomes the, you know, that might be a good... Uh, the reason for it, the, the conditioners have been emancipated from all of that. It is one more part of nature which they have conquered. The ultimate springs of human action are no longer for them something given. They have surrendered like electricity. It is the function of the conditioners to control, not to obey them. We don't obey the law. You obey the law. The rules don't apply to me. You never heard that? You see it in political office all the time now. When people got caught up in scandals 20 years ago, they used to deny, 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 deny. <laughs> and when the denial didn't work because they're so desperate to hold on to the power and people said, no, no, you did this and here's the evidence and you have no choice here, you did this, they would resign from their office because it was proven that they did not believe the laws of the country that they were they were governing it's clear they didn't so they resigned how can you lead a country and have a legal entity called the country if you violate its basic principles yourself as the leader of the country you can't you have to resign and that's a teaching moment for everybody everybody subject to law if a leader will not resign no matter how scandalous and how bad and how dem demonstrable the ills are then this is a sign that we are working for conditioners and we are conditioned and that there are rules for thee that are not for me. So it's the proof positive of what Lewis is saying. It's the fact that there's a victory over human nature. I'll, I'll leave you to look at Lewis sometime yourself. Um, back to this because I have five minutes. Do you have any questions about because I'm I've gone away from Brave New World to the analysis of it and what, why I wanted it on the course. And that's, I think, important as well. Did you have a comment? No? Anyone have a comment or question? Yes? I don't remember that. The coming? I don't know. That's the problem with doing this on a stupid thing on the internet. This is. Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think either. Oh, are, so are these the savages that say this? No. Okay. This is like, uh, well, then it's not in the brave new in, in the world of the uh, one world government. It, it's not anything religious. That's for sure. Mustafa Mond is not having any of that. Whatever it is. 
Maybe they're just tripping. <laughs> I have no idea. I certainly don't think it's a theological statement of any sort. Anyone else? I'm sorry for the way I came at it today, but I thought it was, I really wanted to get to this on the course. Because it, it really, and, and using the C.S. Lewis, uh, Skinner calling him, you know what, I'll, I'll show you as well, Skinner. There's the book. Beyond Freedom and Dignity. This is the conditioner. Who's the defender of freedom and dignity? C.S. Lewis. We need to get beyond that. It's two view of the humanities. One, which he presented, the old bird teaching the young birds to fly, following the same rules, living the good life, living it himself as he best he can, modeling it to others, saying they should live the same way, especially writing it during wartime. It's 1943 when he writes it. It's in the middle of the Second World War. People are being sent to the lines to die in battle to defend civilization. Why is it good to die for your country? Why is it good for you but not for me? It's good for all of us to do it because we're defending something worth defending, worth fighting for. That's the context for it. Um, Lewis believes that the fight is worth having. If the Nazis win, then the conditioners on their side who show that they have no moral scruples, scruples will destroy us. But his book is suggesting the enemy is also right here alongside of us. I don't know if he uses the enemy per se, but there is a hostile force hostile to the idea of human nature that's right in our midst. And B.F. Skinner is one such person. He's so provoked by Lewis's essay, The Abolition of Man, I'm sure, that he writes this and says, I can do something. We, in fact, in sociology and psychology, rather, we can do better. We can make people happier, which is the outcome of a virtuous life. They can be happier right now. And we can prevent crime, which is a blight on the human condition. We can prevent disease, which is a blight on the human condition. We can prevent war by conditioning, etc. All of these things, if we just give ourselves over to applied psychology, we can avoid the ills and we can have the goods. And we don't need virtue. Virtue is an unreliable guide. Some people will have it and some people won't have it as much. Some people will use their freedom. Other people will abuse their freedom. Let's not leave it up to chance. Let's make certain of it. That's what he's saying. And there's a debate there over what the best way to educate um, the future is. And the debate is uh, governed by the BF Skinners of the world. I am a dinosaur. Yes. In Deuteronomy 6, the Shema? The Shema. I mean, all throughout Deuteronomy. All throughout Deuteronomy. Remember, you don't forget. Yep. Yes. Yes. Yep. And they don't think that the rules that are conditioning the others, and they won't apply it to them either. And that's the, that's, that, that, that was the, also the lesson of communism in the 20th century. The elite operate by a different standard. So it's, it's comrade and you know the workers' party, we do it for the workers and equality, et cetera, but <laughs> not for the Politburo, not for the inner sanctions of the Communist Party, they live a different life. Different rules apply, and they, but they, they punch downwards, as it were. 
Anyway, I've given you a lot to think about, hopefully. Uh, but that is the novel. Uh, next time we'll look at 1984. I'm going to take three takes at it because it's three sections. And the three sections are neatly divided for my three lectures. But more to the point, there are, they are stages within the novel which I think are quite helpful looking at individually like that. So I'll, I'll give a sort of an overview at the beginning and then I'll get into one. If, you're, if you haven't read it all and want to say, what, well, what's he going to go through? I'll try and do it in one, two, three. Okay? I'll see you then.